about now. All right, perfect. So I have you loud and clear. I can see your slides. You're ready to go. Thanks for attending and looking forward to your talk, David. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Mike. And thanks very much for inviting me onto the event today. Um, it's a great privilege to be here. Uh, I'm David Hambling. I'm an author, technology journalist uh, and consultant. I write for Aviation Week magazine, New Scientist, The Economist, Wired, Popular Mechanics, and a few others. And a lot of what I write is about drones. Um, perhaps the most relevant thing for today is a book I wrote in 2015 called Swarm Troopers, How Small Drones Will Conquer the World, which has proven surprisingly accurate about the evolution of the small drone threat. Today, I'm going to be talking about new technology and why a smart drone is a dangerous drone. I'll be looking at new commercial technology that enables smart drones, how it works, what it can do, what sort of threats it poses, and what we can do about it. And along the way, we'll be finding missing pallets and missing persons, racing and chasing, spotting sharks, oiling eggs, and completely ruining the game of chess. The short version of all this is that drones are getting smarter, and that makes them a lot more useful. It also makes them a lot more dangerous in the wrong hands. And if you're not at least a little bit scared by the end of this, then you haven't been paying attention. Now, it's a bit unfair calling new drones smart because it implies that the current drones are dumb. And as we all know, even little quadcopters are very smart indeed. Uh, they're the ones that do all the work. The human operator is really in the same situation as someone sitting in the back of a taxi. He tells the taxi where to go, but it's the taxi driver that does all the work. And it's the drain, brain of the drone that does all the work in controlling the four engines and uh, adjusting the relative speeds of those. Uh, and that's something that's way too fast for any human to handle. Um, so, and they can also do lots of other things on their own. They can land, they can take off, they can navigate via a set of waypoints. Um, so it's really not fair to call them dumb. Now, if, if you do want to see a real dumb drone, then the thing at the bottom, which is a um, US Air Force MQ-9 Reaper, uh, that really doesn't have a lot of intelligence on it. Um, you, you need to have a pilot's license in order to fly it. It's not capable of automatic landings or takeoffs or anything like that. So that's really quite brainless. However, even the little quadcopters are comparatively dumb because they still rely on the human operator. They can fly a pre-planned mission, but they can't react to what's going on around them. It's this reliance on a human operator that is the distinction between what I'm calling dumb drones and new generations of smart ones. Now, the current drone threat is basically a guy standing in the road with a radio controller and a drone. And jamming the radio controller is the far and away the easiest way of defeating drone threats. Uh, basically, it, you can do two things. One is you can jam the link between the controller and the drone, so they can't control it or see what the drone is seeing. Uh, when that happens, most commercial drones will go back to the, the last point where they had good communication. The other thing you can do is jam the drone's GPS so it can't locate, uh, and when it's completely lost, the drone will simply land itself safely. We love jamming because it beats the threat. It's simple, it's cheap, uh, there's no kinetics going on, so there's very little risk of collateral damage, and that's why this type of technology is now quite ubiquitous. There are literally hundreds of different drone jamming systems out there now, You'll see them at the Olympics, you'll see them at the G20 summit, you'll see them at presidential inaugurations, football games, and lots and lots of prisons now have extensive jamming systems to prevent drones from bringing in contraband. Uh, and they have proven very effective in action. Um, perhaps the biggest demonstration of that was at Mosul in 2017, when US-backed Iraqi forces were getting repeatedly bombed by small ISIS drones with 40 millimeter grenades, and there were literally dozens of attacks every day, which was practically stalling the attack. Um, they had real problems for four days. As soon as they brought in jammers, they basically swept the skies clear of drones, problem solved. So jammers are the solution at the moment. Now, as I like to say, drones are basically smartphones with wings. And one of the interesting developments with smartphones is that they're now getting smarter. Um, the reason why I say drones are smartphones with wings is because things like the data processing, the storage, the accelerometers, the gyros, the cameras, the compass, navigation, communications, 
all this type of stuff comes from the world of consumer electronics. And that's really what's enabled the small drone industry as we know it. And that's what's made them so cheap, while comparable military hardware is incredibly expensive. Now, smartphones are changing with a new sort of technology. Um, because Moore's law has really slowed down, companies are looking at new ways of improving capability of computing. So in 2017, Apple introduced their first A11 Bionic processor featuring a neural engine. And this is specifically intended to enhance artificial intelligence applications uh, and machine learning. That runs at 600 billion operations a second, which is so big as to be completely meaningless. Uh, the thing that puts it in context is that by 2021, four years later, Apple introduced the A15 neural engine, which is capable of 16 trillion operations per second. So basically, they've got 30 times faster in four years. Now, this is technology that's very good for pattern recognition. So your phone's facial recognition will be using that bionic chip. Things like text-to-speech, automatic translation, it's all based on machine learning applications. It's all based on a thing called neural networks, um, which are a uh, process mainly for enabling machine learning. Uh, the hardware essentially gives a digital simulation of the same sort of neural processes that take place in a biological brain. So you have an input layer, uh, which is usually connected to sensors, a number of intermediate layers, and then the output. And it does its calculations by changing the weightings of the connections between them, which is exactly the way a brain works. The key thing about this is that it's not programmed. It learns for itself. So it, this allows it to do things that conventional programs can't with a lot less computing power. And the main thing it's good at is pattern recognition. Um, the sort of canonical example is finding cats in videos. So you feed a neural network with thousands of videos, you tell it which ones have got cats in, and it then figures out how to recognize a cat in a video. And it will figure out for itself that it needs to look for ears and whiskers and a tail, but that it could still be a cat even if it can't see any of these things. Uh, and they've been phenomenally successful for that. Uh, it takes a lot of data and a lot of processing to train it. Um, and this is one of the reasons why some of the most successful companies in this are people like Google and Facebook, who have access to vast amounts of raw data, uh, your data. Um, and, and that has enabled them to do things like uh, recognizing individuals online very effectively. Once it's, It does take a lot of processing to train up a neural network. But once you've got the software trained, it can actually work with minimal hardware. So it can run on things like smartphones. Uh, and this does allow you to do things that you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. OK, so a short diversion here into the history of computer chess. Uh, now, a lot of this starts in um, what was probably prehistory to a lot of you. Back in the days when people were still arguing about whether a computer would ever be able to beat a human. Uh, the argument went that computers didn't have human intuition. They didn't have experience. Uh, they had no sense of strategy. They wouldn't be able to get inside their opponent's head and sense their weaknesses. Um, and it was reckoned that it would take a vast amount of computing power to get anywhere close. Uh, the reason for that is that looking ahead in chess requires an exponential increase in computing power the more moves you're looking ahead. So you go from hundreds to millions to billions of possible positions. Uh, and that was thought to be far more than any machine could handle back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, in 1997, IBM sold the chess challenge uh, with a computer called Deep Blue. And this used serious amounts of brute force computing to beat Gary, Gary Kasparov, who was then the world champion human chess player. Uh, it's Deep Blue comprised 30 nodes, each of which had 480 special purpose chips in it. So that's like 14,000 processors. Um, this entire collection, they spent something approaching $100 million on the hardware, uh, and the rack-mounted system weighed about 1.4 tons. Um, so that's the kind of brute force we're talking about. But even in the 90s, uh, chess programmers were already working out ways of playing the game far more efficiently, uh, introducing basically sets of smart rules to cut down the number of possible futures you needed to look at. So things like moving your pawns forward, not exposing your king and so forth. By 2009, the algorithms had got so effective that the Copa Mercosur, which was an international master level tournament in 2009, was won, won by 
uh, software called Pocket Fritz 4. Uh, and as the name suggests, this ran on a smartphone uh, and it had an international rating of 2,900, whereas Deep Blue, the giant supercomputer, had a rating of 2,700. So algorithms proved to be a far more efficient way of playing chess. There was another twist, uh, as you may remember, in 2017, when Google DeepMind uh, released a thing called AlphaZero, which is a system based on neural networks. Uh, unlike the algorithms, which were based on experience of chess and lots of previous games, uh, AlphaZero learned chess from scratch. All they did was give it the rules, and it then played against itself to figure out how to play. Uh, within 24 hours, it was able to beat the best chess programs out there. Uh, and that has a rating of 3,500. Um, so AlphaZero plays chess like no human, using strategies nobody has seen before, uh, and it can do it on extremely austere hardware. And that's when this whole technology starts being interesting in the drone context. Uh, Qualcomm have long been known for their involvement in the drone sector. Um, they're a company involved in integrated systems, and back in 2015, they introduced their first Snapdragon flight. This is a system on a card to bring all sorts of capabilities like advanced video handling, communications, autopiloting, and navigation to a small drone. Uh, it's basically a complete system. It's the brain of a drone. Uh, and as I say, Qualcomm have been extremely successful at that. It says something, uh, the fact that the Ingenuity helicopter on Mars is driven by their hardware. Now, their latest release, which they announced a few months ago, is the RB5 5G. So same credit card size device for packing all the technology you need for a drone uh, in one com complete handy package. The interesting thing is that now the, this new version has lots of hardware for autonomous operations, specifically machine learning. Uh, and interesting, this uh, includes a feature called visual inertial odometry. Uh, which loosely means working out how fast you're going and where you're going by looking at objects on the ground. So this is a technique useful for navigation where GPS is unreliable. So the makers reckon it should be useful for urban environments where tall buildings get in the way or indoors or even underground, basically places where GPS is poor. However, it also means that drones fitted with visual inertial odometry uh, don't rely on GPS for navigation as long as they know they are when they start, which means GPS jamming goes out the window. So immediately, you've got a vastly more capable type of drone. Now, this sort of technology moved into the consumer market big time in 2018 with the launch of Skydio, which was touted as the first smart consumer drone. Um, this is aimed at people uh, doing active sports like snowboarders, surfers, mountain bikers. And the idea is that you don't need to control it at all yourself. Basically, you press a button and you set off to do whatever you're doing, and it will then follow you and film you. Uh, and Skydio have some spectacular footage on their site showing how it can follow a skier or a surfer on their way. And uh, in advance, you can tell it whether you want to film you from in front, behind, beside, or it can actually circle around you as it goes. Uh, and it, it can carry out an entire flight like that. And then once you've finished, you can land, pick it up, and get the video. Now, the interesting thing about that is when it's in flight, obviously, you can't jam it because it's not being controlled from the ground. Now, all that does is shoot movies, but obviously, it could do something far more destructive. Now, another area where neural networks have proven very advantageous for drones is in detect and avoid. Uh, sharing airspace, it's a big challenge not to collide with other aircraft. Uh, historically, if you haven't got a human pilot with a Mark 1 eyeball and a brain to be able to figure out whether there are other aircraft around, you need radar, uh, which is very handy because it gives range and speed and direction. So it allows you to calculate whether a collision is at all likely very easily. Um, the problem is it's big and expensive. Uh, so what Iris Automation did was to develop a smart system just using a normal video camera uh, and, again, lots of machine learning. Uh, so that's been taught to detect, classify, and react to airborne objects. So it can take a look at something, detect whether it's a distant cloud, an object on the ground, a star, or, in fact, an approaching aircraft, and then take appropriate action. They reckon it can detect a Cessna light aircraft from 500 meters away, 
and respond appropriately in a fifth of a second. They've tested this in the air quite a lot. Um, they've actually set up several thousand scenarios where they've got a drone and then they've tried to fly aircraft into it and watch it fly out of the way. Um, so it's proven very successful and it can cope with different lighting and weather conditions. Uh, and basically, this is likely to be a game changer for shared airspace with drones and manned aircraft and other drones. Uh, however, from a threat perspective, the thing to remember is that if you can program a drone to avoid something, you can also program it to run into it. So with detect and avoid, you've got a drone doing something which previously only a human could do. Uh, the next challenge for developers was to get drones to do things better than humans. Uh, the researchers at the University of Zurich have been doing a lot of work in this field. And one of the areas they've looked at is drone racing, which is where you've got uh, drones running around racetracks uh, around obstacles indoors, which takes very tricky path planning. Um, computers can do it, but they're a lot slower than people. So historically, um, drones can only cope with this kind of course quite slowly. Uh, however, again, with the aid of neural networks and machine learning, University of Zurich have develop their drone, which is actually faster than humans. Uh, they reckon it beat the fastest lap of world-class human pilots on their experimental racetrack. So there's the potential here for drones that can fly better than human. Uh, interestingly, the University of Zurich team also looked at uh, putting this kind of path planning to practical use for a search and rescue drone. Um, there, the scenario was it had to fly down forest paths at high speed. The idea here is that uh, rescue drones are very useful for this kind of mission. The problem is every drone requires a human pilot to operate it. So as soon as you start adding drones, you start taking people out of the search team. The idea was to have an autonomous drone which would be able to do the searching, but without tying up any human hands. Uh, and the other thing also, once you've got that, it means you can have any number of drones searching. Uh, it, the software appears to be very effective. Um, interestingly, of course, looking at it from a threat point of view, anything that can search and rescue can also hunt people down autonomously and target them. Drones are very useful for aerial site inspections. Uh, there's all sorts of industrial infrastructure, which is now inspected purely by drone, things like power lines, wind turbines, chimneys, pipelines, uh, all kinds of electrical gear. Uh, and it's an awful lot easier sending a drone up uh, than putting scaffolding or having a guy lowered on a rope. However, the expensive thing about this arrangement is the guy standing in the foreground. Ideally, what you want is a drone that can do uh, all the inspection on its own and then only send details to a human operator uh, if there's something that needs investigating. And already there's a whole load of autonomous drones which are capable of doing this. Uh, many of them, like the ones produced by the Israeli company Air Robotics, are these drone in a box solutions. So you have a base station on site and then every day or whenever it's scheduled, the drone will fly out, fly around, have a look at everything that needs inspecting. Uh, and then send data back. And if it sees anything um, that looks questionable, it will be able to zoom in and get more detailed picture of it. And again, that's something that requires this kind of intelligent capability. Uh, however, of course, from a threat point of view, uh, anything which is able to inspect infrastructure um, can also do mischief. Because if it's capable of, fight, of uh, inspecting an object like an electrical substation and picking out the most important components, it can also target them. Same technology is also being used indoors. Um, interestingly, um, there's literally billions of dollars of material get lost every year in warehouses. Uh, and that's not stuff that's been stolen. It's simply stuff that's been misplaced. It happens extremely easily because if a pallet gets put in the wrong place uh, or if it gets put in the right place and recorded in the wrong place or if it simply gets moved, it's vanished as far as the people working there are concerned. These things are the size of aircraft hangars. Uh, and so quite often you'll they'll find that a pallet isn't where it's supposed to be. So they have to start sending out search teams 
on forklift trucks and ladders. And there's a lot of people who uh, actually have binoculars in warehouses so they can scan the rows looking for missing pallets. Now, again, drones are a much better way of doing that because uh, they can actually get up alongside and read barcodes and things. Um, and there are now a number of drone based systems, including one by an American company called Intelligent Flying Machines. Uh, and the number which I believe use actually use Skydio hardware for flying around inside warehouses and carrying out inventory. Uh, now, again, this is uh, relying on smart machines to do it. Um, and what's interesting from our perspective is that the drone is flying around a cluttered unknown environment with uh, narrow enclosed spaces and unknown obstacles with no previous knowledge. Uh, and it's flying around picking up RFID tags and barcodes. Uh, and if it can operate in that kind of environment, it can operate anywhere. So essentially, nowhere is now safe from smart drones. Now, getting into more specific target recognition capability, there's a company called Westpac, which does these little ripper drones in Australia, uh, which have proven very successful for beach watching for life saving and keeping an eye on things. Now, one of the areas that they've recently moved into is spotting sharks. Uh, it's obviously a lot easier seeing sharks from the air than uh, from a, a tower on the beach, but it's still quite challenging. Uh, humans, from a fixed wing aircraft, you've got like 15% chance of seeing a shark. Uh, helicopters, 20%. Humans using uh, a drone, imagery of 20 to 30 percent so the idea was let's have a drone with a machine learning system and we'll train it to recognize sharks uh, and in particular it needs to be able to distinguish a shark from a dolphin or a swimmer or a surfboard or a boat or any of the other confusers that you have in the wa water uh, and at the moment their shark spotter drone is actually up to 90 percent accurate for finding sharks compared to 30% for humans. So it's already astoundingly accurate uh, and out there saving lives. So moving on then, one from simply recognizing objects on the ground, uh, the next level up is drones which are recognizing objects and then responding to them. Now, the US Navy has a big problem with bird strikes around its air bases. Uh, and one of the main causes for that is birds' nests, because if a nesting bird has young, it will be flying to and from that nest at low level many times a day. And it's far more of an obstacle than a bird which uh, it simply goes out once to a day to forage. You can kill the birds. The problem is that just creates a vacancy and more birds move in. You can destroy the nests, but the birds simply build new nests. The smart way of getting rid of them or getting rid of the problem is by oiling the eggs. Because if you just spray um, cooking oil over an egg, it prevents it from hatching. So the birds will carry on there. They won't make a new nest. They won't lay any more eggs, um, but the egg won't hatch. So you don't then have this problem with um, birds going to and fro all the time. Now, previously, it's only been possible to oil eggs for ground nesting types. Um, but if you put your sprayer on a drone, you can get nests up in cliffs and on infrastructure. Now, the US Navy are moving this up a step um, to this thing, which is the Intelligent Remote Egg Oiling System. Now, that's a commercial drone with an egg oiling device uh, and, again, neural network-based system for recognizing and responding to nests. So this is able to fly around, identify where a nest is, home in on it, look inside and see if there are eggs inside, and then spray them with oil, uh, all the while maneuvering around obstacles like power lines and antennae. And all the human operator has to do is start it going and then click a button to approve when it wants to go ahead with oiling. Uh, and this can tackle multiple nests in one mission on a single battery charge. So essentially, you've got a, a smart egg oiling system there. Uh, or put it another way, it's a terminator, but it's all it's terminating are eggs. How long before someone starts creating autonomous small drone systems which are able to seek out humans and target them? 
Uh, well, it looks like this is something that actually may already have happened. There's a Turkish company called STM that make this um, cargo multi-copter drone. Uh, it carries a 1.3 kilogram explosive charge, and it's in service with the Turkish military. Uh, it's also been exported to at least three other unnamed customers. Um, now, normally this is used in operator control mode. So the operator is identifying a target using the drone's camera uh, and then directing it into it. However, according to the makers, it does also have an autonomous mode in which it's capable of finding targets on its own. Now, according to a report from the UN Security Council's panel of experts on Libya, uh, which was published this March, uh, one of the sides in the Libyan conflict has actually already used these drones in the autonomous mode to attack targets. We don't know how the UN Security Panel knew that, um, because obviously from the receiving end, you can't tell. So presumably they had some insider information on that. But that suggests that autonomous drones are already being used, by the military at least, to attack targets. So expect more of that uh, and expect that capability to reach the non-military sector in the very near future. Going forward, it's not just single drones you need to worry about. Uh, we've all seen these fabulous light shows with thousands of drones doing choreographed maneuvers in the air uh, and creating shapes and spelling out words and things. Uh, now, those are actually all centrally controlled by a single operator, and there's a load of sensors on the ground that track the drones and tell them where to go. However, uh, a lot of militaries, including uh, the US, China, Russia, Israel, Iran, uh, the UK, and India, are developing drone swarms which don't have any central control. The idea is that the drones are all individual autonomous agents and they use a simple set of rules similar to those used by flocks of birds to all fly together without colliding and carry out cooperative missions. Uh, obviously when you've got that you've then got a large number of drones that are capable of seeking out attacking targets at the same time. Uh, interestingly swarming is one of the developments that's on the uh, list of plans for the STM's cargo. So this pretty much takes us up to Slaughterbots. Uh, now, if you haven't seen it, Slaughterbots was a fictional video which was released in 2017 um, by Stuart Russell of the campaign against killer robots. And it's a depicted a scenario where you've got these small quadcopters, small quadcopters equipped with explosive charges and cameras and facial recognition uh, and they were just released in large numbers and they would then track down people based on pictures culled from uh, social media. As they said at the time, all the technologies required to create slaughterbots existed in 2017, they just hadn't been put together. Now I'm not quite sure whether that was true in 2017 but it's certainly true now. Uh, and the difference is that now the technologies have already all been put together. So this capability exists. Uh, incidentally, their scenario of having drones individually killing people, um, it's terrifying, but it's not necessarily the most destructive way that such drones could be used. Uh, we've already seen some very creative uses of small drones to destroy things, such as blowing up oil refineries in Saudi Arabia, uh, hitting oil tankers off Yemen and attempting to assassinate the president in Venezuela. Uh, you can cause a lot more chaos by going for specific targets like those rather than simply trying to mass kill people. However, it certainly does create the possibility of mass casualty attacks simply by having lots of drones, each of which attacks one person. In short, then, the threat has evolved. We're no longer looking at one operator standing in the road with a radio controller and a drone from nearby. The drones could be put in position well in advance and activated either remotely or with a timer, uh, and there could be tens or hundreds or more. The only limits to the number of drones is how many they can afford, and as we know, drones are quite cheap. And the other thing is, of course, they're dangerous because they can't be jammed, and that takes away the best weapon that we have in the fight against small drones. So how do we stop them? 
Well, there's been quite a mad scramble on the part of the military looking at alternate solutions. Um, so we have many counter UAS systems out there, um, some of them based on machine guns, cannon and other projectile weapons, uh, lots of missiles, mainly modifications of existing surface to air missiles, uh, quite a few laser systems going online now, also a certain number of high power microwaves, uh, and also uh, my favorite, smart interceptor drones. All of these have their disadvantages. All of them are bigger and more expensive than radio frequency jammers. Uh, and most of them have real collateral damage issues. You cannot go handing this kind of hardware out to civilians. You can't go putting racks of surface to air missiles around airports, or you're going to create a problem far bigger than the one that you're trying to solve. Um, as I say, I, I like interceptor drones because um, they represent a technology that can move along with the threat uh, and is quite easily scalable. So if you're expecting more incoming drones, you can deploy more interceptors. There's a company called Fortem, which already supplies drone hunter interceptors. Uh, they were telling me at one recent event, which was considered a high threat, they actually had 27 drones on call, which could have uh, taken out attackers. So that's not necessarily the solution, but it's certainly a prospective solution. So in conclusion then, um, so the basic thesis of swarm troopers is still valid. Small drones are still on course to conquer the world. This new technology, specifically neural networking hardware with machine learning, makes small drones far more capable and more able to interact with their environment. And the smart drone is a dangerous drone. This is not the end point. This isn't like other threats where you knew at some point someone would develop a technology and then you'd have to deal with it. The problem is we do not know where this technology is capable of. Um, remember the uh, chess playing Alpha Zero compared to the people who thought machines would never beat humans at chess. Well, we don't know, we still don't know just how good they're going to get at chess, but they're certainly going to get better and small drones are certainly going to get more dangerous. As I said, we don't have any great solutions at the moment. What happens next is very much up to you in the drone security community. So the future is out there. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, it's been great being here, being able to share this with you. Yeah, brilliant. Thank yeah, you, David. And, um, yes, I've got your screen off, which is fine. And I've, I've kept you up here. And we've got a few questions that will uh, get to you, if that's right, if you've got a few minutes. Yeah, sure. Far away. Brilliant. And just for a reminder to everyone, we've got questions that can come in through Slack, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and then, of course, Slido. Um, so we'll read some of those out. And, and, you know, David, what you said was really quite interesting about, you know, Libya and that autonomous drone. You know, they found at one point even Wagner troops uh, or mercenaries that had drone footage and, and drone items on their tablets there. Um, I find it quite interesting. You talked about the drones in a, a space with lots of collateral or, you know, cluttered. Talked about the FPV, fast drones, and then there's payload capabilities like LiDAR and 3D, 3D detection. Are we actually seeing the swarming based drones in the battlefield at the moment? Or is that something that there's a lot of R&D? You know, has there been recent events that we can actually point to? Not yet. Um, mm -hmm. Not yet. There is a lot of R&D, as I say. I've... Uh, I've been tracking projects. Uh, there's a lot of work in the US military. Um, the, uh, I remember now, yes, the, we have actually seen the first drone swarm employed in action. Uh, that was employed by the Israeli Defense Forces in Gaza a few months ago. Uh, you may remember they were having quite a lot of problems there with uh, rocket fire from the, the Gaza Strip. Uh, and they deployed a drone swarm unit to tackle that. The big problem with the rockets being fired from Gaza um, was that basically it's just a rocket on a rail. Uh, two guys come up, set it off, fire the rocket and run away before you can do anything about that. Um, so the IDF deployed drone swarms, which were able to give extremely fast reaction. So basically, it wouldn't give details, but it sounded like they were doing perch and stare. They were basically landing a load of drones in an area uh, and then coordinating all the information uh, from their cameras and other sensors, and then providing extremely fast reaction, which may have been from 
armed drones within the swarm or they may have been calling in fire from other areas. So yes, drone swarms are now just starting to be used on the battlefield um, and expect a lot of that in the near future. Yeah, for sure. And I'm, I'm guessing there's lots of facilities or private facilities where there's testing going on that the, the public aren't privy to. Um, and that will happen in some time. And look, how many, I don't know if it was said how many drones were in that swarm, but how many drones can be in a swarm? You know, theoretically, what's the current capability of that? Um, well, at the moment, the uh, the sort of light show swarms, which aren't real swarms, the highest number is about 3,000. Um, the military are typically using two to 300 with a swarm at the moment. Um, but one of the interesting things about this technology is that it scales right up. Uh, as we've seen with flocks of birds, I have watched murmurations of starlings where you've got 50, 60,000 birds all flying together in formation, um, which is quite an impressive sight. The US Navy uh, in their super swarm project, what they're modeling is threat swarms of up to a million members. So potentially you are talking about vast, vast numbers of drones. Yeah, well, that's incredible. So I guess what you're saying is like with the starlings, you've got a bunch of drones that can kind of think independently of each other, not necessarily just in a pre-programmed flight um, in proximity to each other as well. Exactly. So they can, the swarming software means they can all fly together, they can maintain separation, they can all land together, take off together, work in the same airspace. Uh, and there are, in nature, there are some examples of swarm hunters which do work together to comb an area uh, and work actively to um, hunt things. Uh, and there's absolutely no reason why small drones shouldn't have similar levels of intelligence and be able to carry out similar tasks all on their own without human input. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, okay. And and you um, you went through a few different counter drone systems. And given that, you know, you mentioned the Skydio drone, there's the, the Parrot kind of 4G connected drone. You've got some drones which are GPS dark or they, you know, can fly autonomously without some of that. Uh, data. How do you see the counter drone landscape changing? You know, do you think that will just be continued layered approaches, or as you said about lasers, do you think it will go in that kind of kinetic direction? I, yeah, I, I think Alter, if you've got the money for it, um, then yes, a, a, a layered approach is nice, and uh, you want to have all these different levels. So you certainly want uh, you will need lots of sensors, and you will want to start off by using soft methods like jamming. Uh, and then you will gradually escalate right up to, in the end, uh, if you've got drones coming at you, you will want some kind of kinetic solution. Um, that's great if you're defending the White House, um, but it's not really practical for a lot of other uh, potential targets around the place. Um, so I think it's going to be quite challenging. Mm, no, of course. Okay. And, and you're talking about a, a drone around a, a White House or a perimeter asset. Um, Regarding drones with, say, explosive payloads, are, are IEDs, for example, the real threat or CBRN or any other things more dangerous? You know, what do you see as that kind of threat level categorization? I think, I mean, it's it's interesting that uh, where we've, a, a lot of the time, basically, the, the drone is simply a delivery system for an IED. So the argument goes, if people haven't got IEDs, then drones aren't really that much of a threat. Um, that's true to a degree, but it's interesting, for example, uh, here in the UK, we had Gatwick Airport shut down for three days simply because there were drones flying around it. Uh, and I think in, in a lot of cases, uh, particularly where you've got things like aircraft around, a, a drone can be quite a threat just on its own. Um, but in terms of the damage they can do, I think there's also quite a lot of potential for drones, jammers of various sorts um, to cause mayhem. Um, it's you can cause a lot of trouble these days simply by jamming mobile phones and GPS, which is something that drones are very well equipped to do. Uh, and the other thing is incendiaries don't require bomb making skills uh, to create. And we've also found a damage that wildfires can do. Uh, and a, a drone creating wildfires is clearly going to be um, quite a major hazard.
Oh, of course. All right. And, and look, I think there might be just one last question from um, from this collection here because we will move on to the next speaker soon. But realistically, when you look at, at how regulations or restrictions have moved um, and you have these swarm tactics, as you said, you know, with light shows and things like that, do you think there will be any kind of push to restrict that from the public, which, of course, we are not not fans of? But again, you know, in that greater scheme of things, the movie you highlighted, do you think there will be any kind of similar to the whole AI perspective, a restriction on swarms other than military use? Uh, I think the genie is already out of the bottle and it's way too late for that um, because you've got, there's so much of this hardware is now commercially available and thanks to the internet, even if you can't easily get it here, you can easily get it from somewhere else. Uh, it's interesting that um, with the, the, the Turkish cargo, one of the points about uh, their drone is that it was done without, uh, it, it works around the ITAR regulations. Basically, the Turks can build everything themselves. So you've got relatively small players are now able to do that. Um, but I, I think the drones are too much out there and, and any attempts to limit them. Uh, I can see there might certainly be in some areas, some politicians who see it uh, as a, a vote winning thing to uh, protect people by uh, trying to ban drones, but honestly, I can't see it proving any effectiveness against uh, any kind of serious threat. Sure. Okay. Well, David, uh, the utmost thanks for you to come on and um, be the first speaker of our GDSN4. You were the first uh, podcast guest back in the day. And um, of course, for anyone who doesn't know, David's book is sitting behind him, Swarm Troopers, which is an excellent read. So Definitely oh, recommend. and by the yeah, by the way, I've, it's it's half price on Amazon this week. I, I dropped the price for the occasion. <laughs> for the occasion, love it. Thank you so much, David. Appreciate it, and have a good okay. rest of your day. Okay, thanks very much. It's been great.